close to the EU's neighbourhood, which we define a bit wider than others. So we include the UK in the neighbourhood, which it is now, the focus on Northern Ireland, but we also include look into the far east of the neighbourhood, which is Ukraine. And there we will look into questions how rights to move in and out the EU and within the neighbourhood are being compromised and how anti-discrimination rights will be extended into the neighbourhood. That's quite current. And now we have Work Package 4, and this is the first event of Work Package 4, which looks into the global role of the EU. And now, of course, you wonder, well, how is that fitting the narrative? And I think it fits the narrative very well, because the EU's global authority is often only looked at institutionally and now how we engage with war. We just had Zelensky here in Irish universities and hour ago. And I think what is really will bolster the EU's global authority will be its ability to engage with people, with individuals, and not just with states and institutions. And that's why where this work package comes in and looking into the global human rights policy in the EU and how it relates to its geopolitical autonomy. And that's why this first seminar is so very important. I'm really looking forward to the day and about I did uh, to the afternoon, not a full day, unfortunately. But as I mentioned, I'm going to share a one slide, and first I put it on my other screen. And show you what's to come, because this obviously isn't the last event. So there you go. See, we have a series of core academic events. Our next event is already timed for the 19th of January, where we will look into the areas of free movement rights in a pandemic. That's going to be hybrid, so you can come to beautiful Cork and join us there. So and now I didn't want to expand my welcome here and wanted to give the floor without further ado to Andrew and uh, Luigi. And thank you for convening this. And thanks to everybody for coming. And I really look forward to the discussion. Great, th thank, thanks very much, um, Dagmar. So I'll just say a little bit more about the um, context for um, today's um, seminar and the work package of which, which it's part, and then we'll um, we'll move directly to the first um, panel, which is going to be chaired by my colleague. Um, Luigi. So I think that the the broad context in terms of how we're thinking about this is that the um, if you think about the what could be described as the European Union and the global rights agenda, um, I think if you look at that from a 20, 30 year perspective, what you can see is a fairly clear change. So in the 1990s, 2000s, we were at the height, if you like, of the liberal international order. Um, and, you know, maybe we were discussing things like the um, the International Criminal Court uh, responsibility to protect, but also maybe the World Trade Organization and how an increasingly powerful World Trade Organization might impact on uh, economic and, 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 and social uh, rights. Um, if you look at the kind of EU and the global rights agenda from the perspective of um, 2022, we're looking at a, a in some ways, a quite different global situation. So um, firstly, obviously, we have the rise of um, authoritarian uh, states, particularly the rising power of Russia and China, and also their increasing authoritarianism domestically. But one could add um, Iran and other states to that uh, list. Uh, and we see, you know, those states not only kind of increasing the kind of degree of authoritarianism domestically, but also exercising uh, greater uh, influence in international institutions, the UN Human Rights Council, but other uh, UN and UN related uh, bodies. Um, second thing I think we identify is um, changing um, agendas around trade, um, economics and strategic autonomy. So, so questions about um, deglobalization or um, resilience, um, dismantlement of some of the economic ties or potential dismantlement of some of the economic ties that we saw develop in the 1990s and 2000s. And that's linked in with a new um, EU economic trade policy and trade agenda, which again links into issues of um, rights. Um, and then the um, third area that we identify is a whole set of rights agendas in 
um, new uh, areas. So one in particular would be the whole um, digital and information uh, rights agenda. So, you know, what kind of um, rights exist in the digital and inf information uh, sphere? Uh, what role does the EU play in potentially protecting those rights? And obviously we've had the uh, EU GDPR has been one of the big developments over the last uh, decade. Uh, and then again, these things link out to global rights agendas, um, questions about the global division of the internet and so on, and the impact of that on uh, citizens' uh, digital uh, and uh, information uh, rights. And then maybe one other new um, area that we would add is, you know, areas of environmental rights, particularly in the context of uh, climate change. So I think that the broad point is the view that um, the global rights agenda has changed uh, pretty significantly over the last over the last 10 uh, to 15 years. Uh, and that has big implications for the EU and how the EU engages with rights in lots of different areas. So that's you know what we're trying to look at in this um, work package. And then to say this is the um, first uh, event uh, of this work package. And if you saw on the detail of uh, Dagmar's um, slide, then there will be two uh, further events, one um, focusing on uh, trade and economic agendas relating to rights, and that will be in April of next year, I think, Luigi, that's correct, isn't it? And then we will have another focusing specifically on um, human rights in the context of EU-China's relations and the EU's uh, efforts to engage with China, and that will be uh, in 2024. So that's the kind of just to set out the uh, broad um, context for uh, this work package. And what I'll do now then is hand over to um, my colleague Luigi, who's going to uh, chair uh, the first of today's panels. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our first uh, uh, online event of this working package of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. It is a pleasure to see you and or to read your names among the attendees. I have the absolute pleasure to chair this first panel, uh, keeping with the interdisciplinary nature of our Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, the first panel is uh, going to address the uh, global rights, the changing global rights agenda um, from a politics perspective. The second uh, um, panel will address uh, the legal and politi political perspectives. So we combine um, we combine several areas of expertise and uh, I am now um, going to introduce our first speaker in the order of uh, uh, the program. The first speaker today is Professor Karen Smith, who is a professor in the Department of uh, International Relations at the London School of uh, Economics. She is an authority on European foreign policy. She has explored uh, in her scholarship, in particular, the concept of ethic, uh, and foreign policy, so how, for example, the European Union promotes um, values, promotes um, uh, democracy uh, and um, uh, human rights abroad. And uh, um, her, the title of her presentation today is indeed EU foreign policy and human rights. So, Professor Smith, uh, the floor is yours. You have around 15 minutes. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me uh, to speak uh, to this uh, seminar. Uh, so that's a very broad title, EU and uh, and uh, human rights. But what I'm going to focus on is actually my, my uh, core area of expertise uh, in this respect, and it would be EU and the global um, human rights regime centered on the United Nations, and in particular, the Human Rights uh, Council. Um, and I would just say that I'm I'm currently on sabbatical. I uh, was head of department for three uh, years, a very difficult three years. Um, and I am considering developing a project on the EU and the international politics of human rights. So it's quite um, timely that this uh, um, invitation came through to, to speak on this topic. 
Um, so, um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Chinese implicit support for it has revealed an increasingly geopolitical polarized context. So what I'm going to do is focus on geopolitical tension in the context of the global human rights regime and its core institution, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. So the key question for my talk is how is the EU navigating between its declared strong support for a robust international human rights regime and the challenges that are posed by the new geopolitical context. So first, I'm going to illustrate the geopolitical competition that is evident in the politics of international human rights right now by focusing on debates within the Human Rights Council. I'll then illustrate the challenges that the EU faces in achieving unity on some issues at the HRC. And I'll conclude with some very brief thoughts about how the EU might situate itself to better promote and protect human rights within the UN. So the first subtitle then is the pushback uh, at the Human Rights Council. So I think it's important to remember that the international politics of human rights have always been contentious, dominated by great powers and concerns about protecting sovereignty from international oversight, along with only selective condemnations of human rights violations in other countries. But the breadth of the current backlash against existing rights and any, ext any extension of those rights, <clears throat> excuse me, is striking. There is a consistent attempt by authoritarian and conservative states to redefine the human rights agenda to be, first of all, more respectful of sovereignty or domestic jurisdiction, and secondly, to be more respectful of different cultures or, quote, traditional values. And they are using international human rights institutions to legitimize such moves. The twist in this geopolitical culture war is that while China, Russia and China are now key centers of the anti-feminist, anti-gender movement, there are conservative white right-wing parties and governments and democracies that subscribe to the same views. So the backlash is both external and internal to the so-called West. I will see if I can start sharing my slides now. Let's see if this works. <clears throat> Why does it do that? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, well, you know what? Forget it. I'll just <laughs> stop sharing, um, which I can't do. How do you stop sharing? So, oh, sorry, yeah. I'm used to Zoom, and I'm not used to um, well, stop sharing. There's a little a cross thing. on the same thing where you started yeah, sharing, and it. if you click on the cross, there yeah, you go. Got it. Got it. Got it. Sorry. <laughs> I had slides, but I'll just sort of hopefully I'll describe them <laughs> with enough um, enough panache. Um, so anyway, so the Human Rights Council, as you know, is the main UN intergovernmental forum focused on human rights, created in 2006, replacing what was considered the so-called widely discredited and highly politicized Commission on Human Rights. Uh, the criticisms of the old commission came from developing countries who complained they were being singled out for naming and shaming, and from Western countries who complained that human rights violators could easily get elected to the commission. So in 2006, it was replaced by Human Rights Council, a slightly smaller uh, body with 47 states elected from formal regional groups. But it is still possible for countries with truly awful human rights uh, situations to be elected to serve on it. And currently, for example, China, Cuba, Eritrea and Qatar are serving on the HRC. It also includes a new universal periodic review in which the human rights records of every UN state are reviewed. But in its regular business, it also considers the human rights records of specific uh, countries. Now, Russia was kicked off the um, HRC in April 22. Um, only the second time a, a state has been uh, kicked off of the HRC. The first one was Libya um, because of its invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but it has often been uh, a member of the HRC. And in fact, Russia was a leader, has been a leader of the pushback against human rights on traditional and you know focused on traditional values for many years. The United States has been incredibly erratically engaged. First it refused to join, then it joined uh, you know first it refused under Bush to to join, then Obama reversed that, then Trump reversed that and now Biden is back um, uh, with uh, the US on but even so um, the US is generally considered to be a rather um, untrustworthy sort of partner in terms of the HR human rights and the HRC. Um, now, the EU is not 
the EU itself is not a member of uh, the Human Rights Council. It's not even a so-called enhanced observer, which, it, which is a status that it has at the General Assembly uh, in New York. Uh, but instead, the EU, EU delegation in Geneva leads in terms of trying to coordinate the views of the member states, trying to get them to agree on texts of EU-sponsored resolutions and statements that are made in the name of the EU. I'm not interested in what the European Union member states do. I do not consider that to be part of the EU's uh, kind of identity because they are not speaking on behalf of the European uh, Union. So I look at specifically at things that the EU does in the name of the European uh, Union. And of course, only some HR, only some EU member states are on the HRC at any given time. Right now, there are eight out of 47, which is about 17% of the HRC. Now, groups, as Katie uh, Berlin Latikainen and I have written about extensively, are very important players in the UN. Groups such as the European Union, but also Organization of the Islamic of the Islamic Cooperation, the Africa Group, the Arab Group, and so on, are very important players. And in from about 2006 until quite uh, recently, it was this group versus group kind of dynamic that characterized the debates about international politics of human rights. And frequently as it was the West versus the rest, and the West was the European Union, and the rest was composed of these groups. China um, only sporadically engages with groups. It is a member. It does try to lead the G77 at the General Assembly. The G77 is not actually in the really represented in the HRC, but China considers itself to be a member of what's called the like-minded group, along with Russia. Russia, too, hasn't really associated with groups, and neither has the United States. But those are the exceptions. Most countries engage with groups and conduct their diplomacy via groups. Um, and so uh, in that sense, um, the EU is, is, is no different. But of course, that means that the EU is always going to be outvoted. When it becomes a kind of a group versus group dynamic, then the EU is in a weaker uh, position. So that was sort of that, that kind of group versus group dynamic characterized human rights discussions for at least a decade, the first decade of the Human Rights Council. Now, on top of that now, I would argue we have layered this, ge this stronger geopolitical competition between the United States and China, which is also sort of the United States versus Russia and uh, China, kind of Russia being the, very much the, the junior partner. Um, so the challenge for the European Union in this new geopolitics of human rights is not only this group versus group kind of dynamic, but this conflict between the larger uh, powers. Now, human rights have always, as I said, been a polarized um, a situation um, in the Human Rights Council. Um, but, and I had a slide on this, <laughs> using um, uh, uh, statistics from something that's called yourhrc.org, that they, they, a group, the, the Universal Human Rights Group that follows um, the HRC and uh, UN General Assembly business. And what that group, that those statistics show is that actually over time, since 2006, we now at a situation and we have in which we have the highest number of resolutions and largest percentage of adopted resolutions that were voted on. Generally, if a resolution is voted on, it's controversial because you call a vote. You want to prove that not everyone is is for it. We're now at a situation in which 45% are voted on, so increasing polarization, plus the number of amendments that are put forward on resolutions has also increased. Again, people, you know, the states are kind of contesting draft resolutions by putting forward resolutions, and that's also growing, 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 growing. Um, so uh, that the slide just showed uh, that. Now, we can see the polarization in two ways, and I just want to point out two areas in which this polarization is particularly clear. And the first is in terms of debates on the human rights records of P5 members, uh, permanent members of the Security Council. Generally speaking, this doesn't happen, right? They're untouchable and they make it untouchable, right? They use their leverage to make themselves untouchable. Um, so it's very rare to actually get debates on the floor of a UN intergovernmental human rights body on a P5 member. Now, the EU did try to raise the issue of human rights in China in the 1990s at the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre. It was completely unsuccessful about that. However, in 2022, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the time, Michelle Bachelet, finally published an assessment 
of the human rights of, of the human rights concerns in the Xinjiang Uyghur region of China. She did it on the last day, released it on the last day she was in office so that she could then be free of all of the political kind of backlash she was going to get. Um, but she did it because of, of um, complaints that were coming into her office, but also because Western states were pushing her to do this a report. China was pushing uh, back. Now, in the HRC in September, a group of states led by the United States decided to take matters further. In other words, to needle, right? You could argue um, to needle uh, China. Now, the US was, this group was comprised of, and, and please remember the last five countries I mentioned, was comprised of the United States, Australia, Canada, the UK, Lithuania, and then the five Nordic countries, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. This small group tried to put forward a resolution uh, just saying we should talk about the this report. It was defeated. And um, China had like worked its magic on traditionally Muslim countries such as Indonesia and Pakistan, and they even voted not to consider the, the resolution on the floor of the HRC. Now, so that, that's the first resolution. The second was on the second first P5. The second was Russia. And Russia was also the subject of resolutions in the early 2000s because the EU pushed the issue of Chechnya. It was successful twice, but then then Russia worked its magic, and the the issue never became, never was never passed uh, again. But in September 2022, in fact, the day after the China resolution was discussed, 26 of the 27 EU member states tabled a resolution to appoint a special rapporteur on the human rights situation in Russia, and this was successful. Um, uh, so the first time in the Human Rights Council that a P5 member has been subjected to a resolution. Now, it should be noted that China reacted extraordinarily badly and in turn pointed its finger at the United States, criticizing racism and, and whatnot uh, in uh, the US. So although China said that we shouldn't be concerned about the domestic records of other states, it's quite willing to mention the domestic records of other states itself in the Human Rights Council. So there we have one example of geopolitical tension. Another uh, example, uh, the second example of geopolitical tension is the pushback on gender equality. And it has been noted that authoritarian states are weaponizing gender. Um, and they are certainly doing so within the bo body such as the Human Rights uh, Council, where there has been, in, for about a decade, there has been quite a lot of debate about things like traditional fat. Uh, values, traditional families, protect the family, and by family they mean mommy, daddy, and two parents, and two kids, they do not mean gay parents or single parents or anything like that, right? They've got a kind of particular traditional view of the family. They refuse to consider terms such as re reproductive rights, sexual and reproductive health, sexual orientation, and gender identity, and even the term gender itself. So these are very, these are fought over within uh, the uh, Human Rights Council as a kind of pushback on uh, gender uh, equality uh, uh, rights. So just briefly, then that's polarization pushback against rights, in particular gender rights, led by and overlaying all of this is this geopolitical tension. So the challenges for the European Union are how can it react, given that the United States is a bit of an erratic player. I mean, even when the United States was engaged in the Commission on Human Rights, you would often find that it was a minority of one. Um, so very uh, isolated. So a difficult player on human rights. So the challenge for the EU is how to deal with this new geopolitical situation, how to push back against the push uh, back, if it even wants to push uh, back. The problem for the EU is that the pushback is internal. Um, now, EU, the EU can find unity very difficult, and a number of what I call split votes happen every single year. That is, the member states who are on the Human Rights Council don't always vote the same way. The issues that have traditionally divided them are human rights in Israel um, and the occupied Palestinian territories, but also resolutions on racism or inequality. And it's not always the usual suspects that vote differently. Sweden, for example, is one outlier in terms of the right to development. However, and I think we just have to say it straight out, Hungary and Poland are posing particular challenges to the EU, most notably on gender equality issues. 
European states have generally staked out a progressive position advocating LGB, LGBTQI rights, reproductive rights, gender equality, and so on. But there is an increasing schism within uh, the EU on these uh, topics. Hungary, for example, has blocked the use of even the term gender in some EU uh, documents. And that has spilled over into the HRC. So, for example, the Human Rights Council um, miraculously pushed by South American states appointed an independent expert on violence and discrimination against um, uh, people on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. On two occasions, the first uh, in uh, 2019, Poland abstained, whereas the other H, um, EU member states voted yes. Most recently, just now in 2022, Hungary abstained rather than vote forward for uh, this. And, um, and Hungary, in fact, said that it abstained because it reserved the so-called sovereign right to, deter to define the personal scope and content of family relations and of marriage in accordance with its national legislation. Now, so what? <clears throat> so as a result, however, of these divisive debates on sexual orientation and gender identity, the Nordic countries, so the, five, the, the Nordic countries that I mentioned uh, in terms of the China resolution, have increasingly acted together. And if I had I could work the, figure out how to work the slides, you would have seen um, a slide in which I show the number of statements that have been given in the Human Rights Council on behalf of the five Nordic countries until about 2019. And then from 2019, the five Nordic countries plus the three Baltic states. They call themselves the Nordic Baltic Eight. And the number of, they are now, um, so as I can read my uh, slide, in the sort of in the, until about two years ago, the total number of statements these, uh, this group would give in the Human Rights Council was about five. Now it's almost 40. So the NB8 is speaking on behalf of the NB8 almost as much as the European Union does. And they do this not only, they do this regularly on issues that result that involve gender equality, women's rights, and so on, but also on other things. And um, we've been, I've been investigating this and interviewed a few diplomats who have said that this is because they have given up on the EU. The EU is far too conservative and they therefore feel the need to express a much more progressive uh, voice uh, than uh, in uh, an intergovernmental body such as a human rights uh, council. So in sum, the EU is divided on so-called culture war issues, but also on other issues from Russia to the situation between Israel and Palestine. So what can it do? <laughs> Good question, I think. I think it's stuck between a rock uh, and a hard place. I mean, to the extent that they can work, uh, the EU member states can work together, they should reach out to other regions. There has been some success in working, for example, with Latin America or even with the OIC on countries such as in the first case, the rights of the child, and in the second case, um, the Rohingya um, minority in uh, Myanmar. Um, they could engage constructive, much more constructively with issues of importance to the global south, including racism, where the EU has been inexplicably silent or just divided. Uh, colonialist legacies, where China is needling already on colonialist uh, legacies. Climate change funding, I don't think I need to say more about that disaster. Health resilience uh, and so on. But I think we just have to face it that the EU is going to struggle in the new geopolitics of, of human rights. I mean, first of all, prioritizing human rights in this kind of context is gonna be difficult, but we're back to the kind of the slinging of accusations that we saw for, in some of the worst periods of the Cold uh, War. Um, and um, the legitimacy of the human rights regime, you know, could be kind of undermined by this sort of action. Um, so, e, you know, the EU is caught between the great powers and the future doesn't look particularly bright. And that's a wonderfully positive way to, to end, to end uh, my, uh, my presentation. But thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Professor Smith, for this fascinating presentation, which shows that, if anything, there are geopolitical blocks also within the EU and not only uh, in the rest of the world. And uh, uh, let, let us now move on to our second speaker, 
of this panel, uh, Professor Alex uh, Drukowski, uh, who is a professor at uh, University College Dublin. He is um, an expert in authoritarianism. He is an expert in Asian politics. And in fact, uh, he is going to talk uh, to us today about authoritarian powers and global human rights. I should mention that he is uh, the author of a monograph that was uh, published uh, last year by Oxford University Press uh, titled Making the World Safe for Dictatorship. So uh, I am very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. I hope my job is not to give an uplifting message <laughs> uh, because that's, that's uh, I'm not sure uh, I'm very well equipped to do that, but thank you for the invitation. Um, what I plan to do is give a very brief overview of the global human rights system to remind ourselves of kind of its underpinning. I'll talk about the rise of authoritarian powers and the norms they wish to proffer. Then I'm gonna present some results uh, broadly of a paper that um, is conditionally accepted at Journal of Human Rights on China and the UN Human Rights Council. So a lot of what I'll talk about actually dovetails quite a bit with what Professor Smith was talking about. So I might skip a few parts in the interest of avoiding redundancy because um, I agreed with, with pretty much everything she said. Uh, and then I'll give a couple uh, uh, points of just kind of looking forward. So the global human rights system, as we know, is built around norms, which are understood as standards of appropriate behavior. We know that in the second half of the 20th century, states committed to human rights norms at very high rates as measured by ratifying relevant treaties, and these norms spread globally. States also adopted human rights norms that were prevalent in the international system into their domestic constitutions, suggesting that the ideas were viewed as appropriate by a wide swath of states. Pretty remarkably, there's some evidence, it's not overwhelming, but there's some evidence that human rights norms do sometimes have the capacity to encourage uh, changes in state behavior, which is remarkable given that there's usually no supranational authority uh, that can enforce compliance with norms. So the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, for example, has been shown to improve women's rights in ratifying states under certain conditions. Right? Um, so it's not a magic uh, uh, treaty by any stretch, but under certain conditions, human rights treaties can have an impact. However, alongside whatever encouraging findings you might find in, in the literature on global human rights treaties, there's abundant evidence that human rights norms uh, do not have the power to influence behavior in very difficult cases. So in consolidated authoritarian states, ratifying human rights treaties usually does not result in compliance, even after many years uh, in which uh, the treaty has had time to, to take effect. Uh, it's likely that authoritarian states know they face little prospect of domestic enforcement or civil society mobilization after ratifying a human rights treaty. So they're very good at blunting the effects of the international human rights regime. But what about uh, if they want to go further and promote their own norms? This is where the rise of authoritarian powers is important. Um, recent years have shown a well-documented uh, trend towards autocratization. The, the researchers at the Varieties of Democracy Project have uh, examined the contours of that kind of from, from many different perspectives. Um, furthermore, not only are there more authoritarian states and some democratic states kind of backsliding, but authoritarian states are more powerful now than they were in, for example, the 1990s. So for a project, a co-authored project that I'm working on with um, Alex Cooley of, uh, in, in the United States, um, we compare democracy and GDP data from, uh, the democracy data and GDP data from 1991 and 2021. So we basically take the varieties of democracy, uh, liberal democracy index, which kind of ranks all the countries in the world from most liberal democratic, so you know, I don't know, you have like Iceland on top or whatever, and then it goes all the way down and you have, you know, Eritrea and North Korea at the bottom. Okay? Uh, we compare that uh, with um, GDP data, and the results are kind of remarkable. So in 1991, states above the global median score of, of liberal democracy accounted for 89.6% of global GDP, so 90% basically of global GDP. States below the median, uh, 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 Democrat, uh, democracy score accounted for about 10% of global GDP. 30 years later, those numbers are 65% and 35%, right? So much more uh, power kind of accreting to, uh, economic power accreting to less democratic states. The results are even more telling if we slice the data by quartiles. So the top quarter 
most democratic states and the bottom quarter, least democratic states. Uh, in 1991, the top quartile of states in the, in the democracy index, uh, in other words, the top 25% most liberal democratic states accounted for about 84% of global GDP. So this is probably the United States and a lot of the European Union states that Professor Smith was talking about. The bottom quartile in 1991, in other words, the one quarter least democratic states accounted for about 4% of global GDP only. Fast forward to 2021 and the shift is dramatic. The top quartile account for 59% and the bottom quartile 26%. So you're seeing this global, not only more autocracies and more autocratization, but more economic power moving in the way of uh, uh, moving towards uh, less democratic states. Now, of course, those trends are not predestined to continue, right? um, uh, but it's clear that since the 1990s, the relative power of more liberal democratic states has is declined. So what does this mean for human rights? Well, the renewed power of authoritarian states relative to liberal democratic counterparts has enabled authoritarian pushback against liberal ideas in a variety of domains, including human rights. After all, many of the core human rights are constitu constitutive of democracy. And by their own accounts, authoritarian leaders find democracy threatening in many respects. So in addition to not complying or blunting the effects of uh, the international human rights system, authoritarian states may wish to challenge the content of the human rights system itself. Dissatisfied with the existing normative architecture that they perceive limits their sovereignty, they may reject large parts of the system, they may accuse liberal democratic states of being uh, hypocritical, which is a very common tactic, uh, and in tandem with devaluing the status of particularly liberal human rights, they can promote their own sets of norms designed to undermine democratic rights, uh, such as strong conceptions of state sovereignty or civilizational relativism or the kind of traditional values that uh, Professor Smith was talking about previously. So we have uh, the global human rights system built on norms. We have rising authoritarian powers. Let me talk a little bit about uh, a study that I recently did on China and the United, Na United uh, Nations Human Rights Council because uh, after all, China is the contemporary non-democratic state with the most power to change existing human rights norms. It's the world's second largest economy. It's a P5 member, by far the world's most powerful non-democratic state and probably becoming more powerful over the next uh, you know, foreseeable future. Uh, China has been an active member of the Human Rights Council and has been in the membership several times from 2006 to 2009, 2010 to 12, 14 to 16, 17 to 20, and it currently sits on, on the council as well. What norms uh, or issues does, um, uh, I, I would say norms, what norms does China promote or frustrate in the council? So I analyzed the voting record on 159 resolutions between 2006 and 2021 and drew out kind of four conclusions. And none of these are particularly shocking, I don't think, but it's useful to just uh, to think about systematically kind of what, um, what the results of this kind of analysis is. First and most obviously, and this is one that, that again, uh, that the previous speaker mentioned, China's own human rights record is kept off the agenda. Right? Uh, in the resolutions passed during Human Rights Council uh, sessions, the PRC is able to keep criticism of China's policies or practices from being voted on directly. Uh, uh, in some cases, resolutions sit at odds with China's policies, but they don't mention, you know, they don't mention China directly. Um, and uh, the, uh, the example that I uh, develop in the paper is the 2022 um, Xinjiang vote, but uh, Professor Smith already talked about that, so I won't go through the details again, but suffice to say, huge, enormous <laughs> human rights uh, problem, a massive repression of, of an ethnic group, re-education camp, so on and so forth. Um, was was kept off the agenda, right? Which is which is fairly remarkable, actually. Um, so the second, uh, uh, so you might ask, kind of, what is, isn't that just self-interest? Isn't that just a norm? Yeah, uh, uh, is that does that have anything to do with norms? I, I think it does to the extent that it it prevents um, scrutiny, basically scrutiny and accountability. And I think that's that's what um, that that's kind of the the more the, the, the normative um, upshot of that kind of approach. Right? So keeps its own record off the agenda. Secondly, China generally votes no on resolutions that specifically target the human rights situation of a particular country. Of the 63 country specific resolutions that were adopted during that time period, uh, China abstained twice, voted no 44 times and yes 15 times, and nearly all of the yes votes were about resolutions on human rights in Palestine. Uh, or uh, other occupied uh, areas occupied by Israel. Right? So again, consistent with that idea of keeping 
the domestic uh, uh, keeping a strong conception of sovereignty, it, it rejects those, um, those resolutions. Maybe it would vote on them if one on the United States came up, but again, uh, uh, that's, that's uh, hypothetical at this point. Third, China prefers to advance rights that revolve around development. Uh, this is consistent with the PRC's identity as a leader of the developing world or the global south. Uh, development, as it understands it, is a collective, more of a collective state-led rights. And so from this point of view can be read as reducing the focus on individual civil and political rights and elevating state-led development. Uh, China's 2016 white paper on the right to development is explicit that the state is a rights bearer. The right to development is a human right, it says, owned by each individual as well as by the country, the nation, and the entire population. So formulations like, give, like this give the state primary control over realizing and steering that right while also uh, elevating concerns of uh, uh, developing states and the like-minded group, which I'll talk about uh, again in a moment. Fourth and finally, uh, China tends to vote no or abstain on certain categories of resolutions that have been adopted by the council that are seen as kind of more liberal, associated with liberal democratic uh, norms, uh, including um, resolutions on human rights defenders, civil society space, um, interestingly, one where the U.S. and China agree is on the death penalty, um, uh, but China also votes no on, on uh, where abstains on resolutions about gender identity and sexual orientation. Again, this is all fine. I suspect this is not that surprising. I think the more interesting part of the analysis I, I developed is the how question, how China uh, adopts or frustrates these norms uh, in the Human Rights Council. And I talk about four uh, tactics, basically. The first tactic is mobilizing like-mindedness. Perhaps the most straightforward way in which China advances its preferred agenda and deflects criticism of its own record is through mobilizing like-minded states. This tactic sees the PRC mobilize and amplify support from states on issues important to Beijing. Uh, and they mobilize in, in, in particular this, this like-minded group, which is basically a group of developing countries, uh, uh, many of which are, are staunchly non-democratic. Dueling letters in uh, July 2019 about China's repression in Xinjiang illustrate this very well. On July 8, 2019, 22 permanent representatives to the UN signed a letter to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and the HRC president expressing concern about Xinjiang. These are basically European Union states, United States, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, I believe all basically liberal democratic states. Right? Four days later, on July 12th, 2019, the permanent representatives of 37 countries, so 15 more, <clears throat> sent a response letter to, to the same body. Uh, this letter opposed relevant countries' practice of politicizing human rights issues by naming and shaming and publicly exerting pressure on other states. Of the 37 states, only one, namely Nepal, was above the median uh, score on the Liberal Democracy Index of Varieties of Democracy for 2019. Indeed, of the bottom 10 countries in that index, excluding China, uh, nine of those remarkably were signatories in this letter. So the most non-democratic states in the world. The only one that wasn't that bottom 10 a signatory on the letter was Nicaragua, which at that time didn't have, have diplomatic relations with China, but now does, and I suspect would sign the letter if given the opportunity. So there is a constituency for weakening human rights protections globally, particularly uh, in terms of liberal democratic rights. Uh, this is what um, uh, uh, Sonia Cardenas long ago at the domestic level called pro-violation constituencies. Right? These exist at the international level as well. As noted above, I think I think, and, and by, by the previous uh, speaker, by Professor Smith, I think these tactics have contributed to China being successful in keeping uh, Xinjiang off the agenda, which is, which is fairly remarkable given the scope of the repression. So mobilizing like-mindedness, the second tactic is implied coercion. Uh, the line between mobilizing like-mindedness and implied coercion can sometimes be kind of blurry, and there's a lot we don't see very admittedly that goes on behind the scenes, right? Um, but there, is, there are examples of, um, of uh, China pressuring um, other council members, members to vote in particular ways. Um, in 2022, uh, this year, the PRC mounted a pressure campaign to bury the human rights, uh, the, the High Commissioner's report on Xinjiang. Um, it's worth noting pressure outside the conference room of this sort is not new. Uh, again, the previous speaker mentioned the effort to get uh, Tiananmen on the agenda of kind of, in the, wasn't the Human Rights Council at that time, but previous incarnations. Um, and um, as far back as 1989, the PRC diplomats were threatening trade relations in connection with, with UN votes, physically intimidating other delegates and approaching delegates late at night in their hotel room to, to pressure them to vote in particular ways, right? So 
uh, implied coercion mostly in the trade space uh, these days, right? Implying um, <clears throat> to uh, uh, states thinking about not voting with China that um, trade relations would be in peril. And there have been some leaked letters that have shown that to be uh, the case. Uh, so mobilizing like-mindedness, uh, implied coercion. The third is tactical deception. So the Human Rights Council gives NGOs opportunities to comment on resolutions or situations. NGOs for the UN are usually conceived of as independent of the government or as part of civil society. Uh, but the Chinese NGO that most frequently engages with the UN Human Rights Council is basically a gongo, is the China Society for Human Rights Studies, uh, which is not meaningfully non-governmental. Um, the organization's website features no content critical of China's own human rights record and links only to Xinjiang and People's Daily and Hey Geographic subsites of about Xi Jinping. The reason for this uh, is because of the close links uh, between the two organizations and the lack of autonomy of the organization. The leadership of the organization has always been in the hands of current or former party state officials and that remains true today. Xi Jinping himself acknowledged the connection and the importance of the China Society for Human Rights Studies in China's global human rights strategy in this year, saying, it is necessary to give full play to the roles of the China Society for Human Rights Studies and the China Human Rights Development Foundation, which is this kind of parent, um, and to increase its influence on multilateral human rights institutions such as the United Nations. Notably, in light of the tactical deception argument being made here, uh, this quotation uh, appeared only in the Chinese language remarks and not in the English language summary. Now, you might ask, okay, everybody knows this. Well, so uh, of the 19 um, reports submitted by this organization, all 19 advanced the PRC's view on key issues. Um, more than half were about how there were no human rights abuses in Xinjiang, that was six reports, or Tibet, that was four reports. Um, now you might ask, okay, this is a gongo and kind of everybody knows it's a gongo. Um, and that's true to some extent, but I think what it does is it gives cover to some like-minded states. And also I think people who don't know much about China don't always know it's a gongo. So this very organization actually visited Ireland a few years ago and I was quite surprised at the credulity given to it and the doors open to it, um, even though it was very clearly not a genuine human rights NGO. Fourth and finally, uh, the fourth tactic is repression to silence critics. Uh, China works to keep critical voices off the agenda at council meetings. Uh, when it comes to the Human Rights Council, in the first instance, the PRC attempts to prevent domestic critics from actually traveling uh, to the council, from leaving China basically, um, to, go, um, to go testify before the council. If they are able to leave, they are surveilled and intimidated. Uh, UN officials have told journalists that the PRC regularly tries to block activists or officials like the Dalai Lama or Uyghur leaders from speaking at the Human Rights Council, alleging that they are terrorists or criminals. So those four modalities, I think, are, are sort of interesting and they show, um, uh, kind of illuminate a little bit the how question of how these norms are advanced at, at the Human Rights Council and how certain norms are frustrated. Finally, looking forward, I'll give two concluding points. Um, one is that advancing authoritarian visions of human rights um, are, is a real strategy. Right? Um, the rising power of authoritarian states, in particular China, is likely to mean the strategy is going to be more and not less prevalent. Uh, the second concluding point and the very, very last point is that the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and Chinese assertiveness in the last few years on a variety of issues, including um, sanctioning human rights researchers and uh, members of the European Parliament for human rights ad advocacy, um, I think has reminded European publics and some European political leaders that authoritarian great powers are a real threat. Uh, time will tell how this plays out, but I think we're in a different place now than we were five years ago uh, with regard to coming to grips with the normative implications and the political implications of authoritarian great powers. So I'll leave it there. Excellent. Thank you for sharing your views on these issues. It was a very thought-provoking presentation and I really look forward to the discussion that we will have after we have heard from our third speaker, which is our very own, if I can say so, uh, Andrew Cotte, who is a professor here in UCC. He is uh, the uh, Jean Monnet Chair in European Political Integration, and he has extensive expertise on European security. He is the author of a book on security in 21st century Europe, which is now I think going to come up in his third edition and um, he is also the author of a, a book called Understanding Chinese Politics and uh, today he is going to give us a presentation titled The EU, China and Human Rights, 
old and new agendas. So we are in very safe hands with uh, this panel today. And uh, um, Andrew, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. It tends to work better if you unmute yourself. That, 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 that's always a good idea, isn't it? <laughs> th th thanks very much, um, Luigi. So as Luigi said, I'm going to focus specifically on EU, China and human rights. Um, I suppose I will be focusing on the EU side of the equation, so EU um, policy. Um, and I guess my broad argument would be that there are a set of new agendas, but also old agendas that haven't um, gone away. Um, so partly what I want to do is just trace um, the historical evolution of the human rights issue in EU-China relations and in uh, EU uh, policy. And I'll suggest you can think of it in terms of four um, periods. Firstly, we can think about the um, the Cold War uh, period uh, when it was a relatively low um, profile um issue in the sense that EU foreign policy uh, was only embryonic at this point, and that was the same for the human rights dimension of um, EU foreign policy, and at the same time economic ties between um, Europe and China were uh, relatively limited, so this was obviously before, mostly before the period of China's dramatic um, economic growth. Um, the second, you know, very short period I would highlight then is the um, Tiananmen Square massacre, an immediate um, period um, after that, uh, when the EU did, alongside also the United States and Japan, uh, impose pretty comprehensive sanctions, or what was then in fact the European Community did impose pretty comprehensive uh, sanctions on China, but those sanctions were lifted within a few years. So even by the mid 1990s, those sanctions had been um, removed. Um, the third period then I would suggest is what you could call the era of engagement. So here you're talking about most of the 1990s um, through the 2000s and perhaps even into the early um, 2010s. And this was the point also when uh, the EU and China developed what they came to call uh, their strategic uh, partnership. So more broadly, the EU was seeking to engage with China uh, on international issues uh, through economics, on even issues such as climate change, but also to engage with uh, China uh, on the uh, human rights issue. And I'll come back with some more uh, specific comments on uh, the nature, limitations and lessons of uh, engagement. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, from um, about the mid 2010s, uh, you see the emergence of a more hard headed um, EU uh, policy towards uh, China. Uh, and this is um, summed up in the EU's 2019 uh, China policy document, which now is quite widely quoted, describes China as a cooperation partner, an economic competitor, uh, and a systemic uh, rival. Uh, and of course, one of the um, you know, challenges for the EU is you know, what is or should be the relative balance between those different uh, elements and how does the EU uh, manage uh, that balance and that maybe links into the, uh, the human rights um, issue. Um, so that's my um, historic framing, if you just trace uh, EU-China relations and specifically the human rights um, bit within uh, that. And what I'll do next is then focus on two things. Firstly, say a bit about um, the uh, engagement uh, strategy and era. Uh, and then secondly, I'll um, come on to what I describe as the new era of realism. But as I say, um, realism is problematic and can mean a variety of different um, things in this context. So, as I say, I mean, engagement with China was the central um, component uh, of uh, EU policy to China, certainly through the 1990s and 2000s and arguably uh, into the early or even mid um, 2010s. Um, and in terms of human rights, I guess you could describe this um, either as a kind of period of optimism from an EU perspective, 
uh, or alternatively, one could describe it in terms of naivety, uh, or I guess one could also describe it in terms of um, self-delusion. Uh, and I guess kind of pick your term in terms of which descriptor you think is perhaps um, more accurate. Um, three elements then to EU policy. One obviously was the um, massive expansion of, econo of economic ties with uh, China, so trade, but also uh, investment by uh, European countries uh, in China. Um, not directly driven by uh, human rights, but there was an element of a kind of human rights logic in terms of the, um, the, the you know, the sometimes described German policy towards Russia and also uh, sometimes China of change through trade. Um, although, you know, one could make a case that particularly perhaps in the case of EU and European policy towards China, that was arguably a kind of uh, post hoc rationalization, I guess. Um, the second thing which the EU did was the use of a kind of quiet diplomacy approach uh, with China. So this was to raise uh, both generic human rights issues and sometimes um, specific human rights cases relating to particular individuals or particular uh, groupings with China, uh, sometimes done at a high level, sometimes done through the uh, office of the EU uh, delegation uh, in uh, Beijing. Uh, and then the um, third element of uh, this was the EU-China uh, human rights dialogue. So from the, uh, I think it was about the early or mid-1990s, China proved willing to agree to a formalised uh, human rights dialogue uh, with uh, the European Union, which involved effectively um, diplomats and experts sitting down uh, and discussing a range of uh, human rights issues uh, and the uh, challenges uh, involved. Um, so, as I say, for me, those were the three kind of elements of the human rights dimension of engagement um, with uh, China. Uh, I think, you know, it's very difficult not to conclude other than that this policy has failed. Um, if you look at this situation, there are some examples where China appears to have responded, particularly perhaps occasionally, uh, to some of the quiet diplomacy uh, of the uh, European Union. But those examples are limited and rather few and far apart. Uh, and they were often in situations perhaps where uh, China wanted something in return, uh, or uh, alternatively, China was under pressure in some sense, diplomatically and politically, and decided that perhaps it needed to kind of uh, move uh, a little bit. But those kind of Chinese responses to uh, EU quiet diplomacy, as I say, were rather um, uh, far and few apart. And again, similarly, I think you can say the same thing with the human rights uh, dialogue. There's you know, relatively little evidence to suggest that the human rights dialogue led to uh, the Chinese government or other Chinese institutions uh, changing their policies. And then, of course, you know, the obvious you know, point is that if you look over this period between the 1990s and the uh, 2010s, accelerating in the 2010s, China has become significantly more authoritarianism. Um, the situation has worsened dramatically, obviously, in Xinjiang, but more generally, the human rights situation within China has, wor has worsened. And of course, we've had the kind of uh, imposition, effectively, or the reimposition of kind of full uh, CCP uh, rule, if you like, uh, over uh, Hong Kong. Um, the other criticism that's sometimes made of this period of policy uh, is that the existence and carrying on of the human rights dialogue was sometimes viewed as a kind of propaganda coup for China because it at least allowed the Chinese to say, look, we're engaging with uh, human rights issues and the EU is is, is engage, engaging um, with us. But as I say, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the broad lesson, as I say, I think really you, you can only conclude that in terms of human rights, the policy of engagement uh, essentially failed. Um, so then on to the current period, which you can um, date from you know, some point in the 2010s, maybe in the mid uh, 2010s. And I, I would describe this as um, an era now of uh, realism, but I'll come on to uh, 
some of the problems with what that might uh, mean. So obviously, as mentioned, you know, the, the, the human rights situation within China has worsened um, significantly. Um, the other significant change is that the EU has really, for the first time since Tiananmen Square, uh, begun to apply some diplomatic uh, and economic and technology sanctions uh, in relation to human rights issues, particularly in relation uh, to um, Xinjiang uh, and uh, Hong Kong. But it should be noted that those um, sanctions have been you know, relatively kind of limited in scope and scale, particularly on the uh, the technology kind of economics uh, side. Um, the third element that's um, new has been China's willingness to respond with counter sanctions. So when uh, the EU has sanctioned Chinese uh, officials involved in uh, or said to be involved in the repression in uh, Xinjiang, for instance, then uh, China has responded by uh, sanctioning certain uh, members of the European Parliament and also, you know, individuals involved with uh, think European think tanks that have been uh, critical uh, of China. And this kind of raises the issue of, you know, kind of tit for tat sanctions uh, and the possible costs for the EU. The next kind of new bit would be, and again, this is something which um, I think Alex has um, um, written about in, in his book, but would be the um, externalization uh, of uh, Chinese uh, authoritarianism. So uh, Chinese authoritarianism is now not simply something which happens only in China and is simply contained within uh, Chinese borders, but it is in various ways is being uh, externalized. So China is uh, beginning to uh, export its model, if you like, of high tech authoritarianism to other states, so providing other states with advice on, you know, uh, control of uh, dissidents and so on. Um, there are issues, I think, also about um, data and uh, information sharing vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, non uh, citizens. So I'm just reminded of my own last trip to China, and I was quite struck that when I went to, and this is a few years ago. Uh, when I went to China, um, you know, you you were you were scanned and so on when you arrived at at, at the airport. Um, you know, you could see kind of um, you know the the rain, you know, the the kind of video cameras and stuff on the street. So you know, I mean, I don't know, but I I I I, I guess probably even though I'm rather unimportant, there's probably some obscure electronic file containing de de data on me, and I don't imagine that the the, the 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 um, EU GDP, GDPR regulations are being being apl applied to that, but I think I think you know that 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 there may be a more general issue there. A um, couple of other things. There's also the Hong Kong um, national uh, security law, which has elements of extra territorial extra territorial uh, jurisdiction, so extending that uh, beyond Hong Kong. Uh, and recently, we've seen stuff in the news about the. Uh, activities uh, of um, Chinese uh, embassies uh, in terms of monitoring and perhaps repressing, um, you know, people who may be political opponents of China, of China within uh, countries like um, UK, uh, Netherlands, Canada, I think, have recently been uh, mentioned um, uh, in uh, this context. So there are a whole range of new issues around the kind of externalization of China's um, authoritarian uh, model. Um, so I'll finish up now just with a few um, conclusions. Um, firstly, I think for me, in, in analysing this, we could describe it as a kind of long journey from uh, idealism uh, or naivety uh, to uh, realism. Secondly, you know, there's a clear learning process. I think, you know, we, we you know, in, in the 1990s and, you know, even in the 2000s, there was, you know, hope, belief that engagement might really lead, lead to change in terms of China's human rights situation. That's clearly failed. Um, secondly, and I think, you know, we see once again some long-standing dilemmas. So the, the you know, the, the dilemmas about the, the balance or the choice between uh, interests and values in terms of the uh, trade question, um, questions about how much of a threat does Chinese authoritarianism pose beyond uh, China's uh, borders. Um, and this then would be my final point 
if we're in, you know, a new era of realism uh, in uh, EU views of or policies towards uh, China, uh, I think one should highlight that realism may come in uh, many guises. So it may be realism about uh, China and the Chinese Communist Party and the need for a hard headed uh, policy. But it could also be realism uh, about how economic interests can trump uh, human rights. And it may also be uh, realism about how far uh, external actors uh, can change the behaviour uh, of uh, authoritarian uh, states uh, such as China. Uh, so I'll finish on that note and I'll hand back to Luigi. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks to all the three speakers. This was a very thought provoking panel and um, I will now invite uh, questions from uh, from uh, anyone in the call, really. And while you think about the questions, I, um, um, I will offer one uh, immediate reaction, which is yes, so human rights are uh, standard standards of behavior, normative standards of appropriate behavior. I wonder to bring it back to the uh, squarely to the scope of our center of excellence. The question could be for the EU how to activate those standards of behavior or how to make sure that citizens can activate that. And I think there are avenues both inside and outside the European Union, which we shall explore in uh, our future research. Uh, and uh, I thank the speakers also for uh, starting, uh, putting me on the right track for that when they spoke about mobilization of civil society or mobilization even of other states. And uh, OK, I think it is very interesting and I cannot wait to hear the opinion of the speakers on uh, certain topics. Perhaps to break the ice, I can start by asking, and I think it's a question for all the panelists, really. Um, in times of geopolitical competition that sometimes escalates in war, but let's call it competition, what should be the EU's weapon of choice, so to speak, if we have to use the word weapon? In other words, how much reliance should there be on rights? Um, and perhaps that's closely related to the question how much reliance there should be on law. I and if there are any questions from uh, uh, from the other people in the call, by all means, uh, perhaps we can field some questions. Dagmar, please. There we go. <laughs> and put your microphone down. Yeah, I was really would really tally on what what you started with, Luigi. I was listening to these presentations. I was hearing conversations between states, between groups of states, and between the EU and states. And I was wondering, where's the citizen there? Yeah. <laughs> Do you see any role for citizens as political scientists in human rights policies? And what could this role be? Um, so because for a lawyer, of course, we think, OK, rights, they need to be activated not only to judicial interaction, but also civil society interaction. But we look at people, at least me as a lawyer, look at the people. And this doesn't seem that's difficult to translate to the international human rights agenda. I appreciate that. But do you see any links? And in fact, I will add uh, one question that I had, uh, um, especially in fact for the, for the second and third speaker, which is to expand a bit more on the role of sanctions and how how do you evaluate the human rights sanction regime of the European Union? Because that has to do with individuals, because it yeah. does sanction individuals. Do you want us to uh, yes, please, answer please, that? Please, please, please. Uh, yeah, fascinating, very fascinating um, uh, conversation here. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about um, what happened to the international human rights regime during the Cold War. And I think Alex was, was correct in saying it did develop 
I mean, in other words, we had two covenants. We had there was some progress and so on. I mean, I've studied genocide, for example, we had a genocide convention. Um, and we had uh, the Helsinki Final Act, which ended up, I mean, some would argue, possibly sparking um, the people's revolutions um, that brought down uh, the Soviet, the communist um, empire. So my, in, so in other words, when I try to think of, well, there could be hope, but then I think the dictators, as Alex says, are onto it. They got that, not even just dictators. I mean, Andrew, you talked about being patted down in, in China. I went to Israel and and, and uh, once and on my way out, I because I'd gone on a Palestinian tour of the of the West Bank beyond on the other side of the wall. And I mean, I was almost didn't catch my flight on the way out. I would have thought they would have wanted me to <laughs> the but they kind of they took everything apart and went through everything and all the rest of it. And of course, Israel is one of those countries that shut down NGOs, no external funding of NGOs and so on. Just like the, the, the you know, the actual dictators, have, they, they're on to this, right? They know how to shut down civil society. And so where the people are, are is repressed. Um, and that, you know, the, the, in ways I think that make it extraordinarily difficult for other countries to have an impact um, because you can't do it via this, you know, that whole, what, I think somebody uh, mentioned it, the kind of the, the um, but it's not the sling back, it's the, I can't remember, the, the boomerang. That's it. But, you know, the, this kind of, the, that somehow you're just going to, NGOs will pressure other NGOs and they'll pressure the governments and this is going to change. And it's, all, you know, it's a one big happy family kind of circle. I'm not sure that that can work anymore. Um, so then what is left? What is in the toolbox? And I mean, I think that's what's left in the toolbox is normative standing, which means, you know, purer than pure. And this is where I think for the EU needs to be considerably more forthright about its own weaknesses, not just the weaknesses of the European Union, but the weaknesses of, of Europe um, and the colon and colonial legacies. Um, and this has kind of started with return of, of stolen antiquities to other countries and so on. So, but I think much more kind of forthrightness about that. In other words, we can own up to our past, you know, so, you know, we're not, we're not saying that we're better than anybody else, but we are saying we can have a free discussion about it so that you play on the kind of that normative standing. Um, because I think, I think many those citizens aren't queuing necessarily queuing to live in authoritarian states they may have to work in qatar because they don't have any money but they don't you know they've seen what it's like right so where do you want to move you want to move to europe or the united states and so on that's where you want to live because you've got the right so i think playing yeah. on that normative standing is one one thing and I have just been shocked by the appalling poverty of the approach to the developing world over the Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. For goodness sake, we should have been saying, not talking about this is a European security matter. We should have been said, this is what happened when a powerful country gobbles you up, right? This is what the United Nations was designed to try to prevent. It is self-determination, it is territorial integrity, and we all have a role to play in, in keeping this up. There were a few brilliant interventions in the Security Council and the General Assembly from a few African countries right at the start. That has dissipated, right? And the, the Europeans should have said, you know, because it was pointed out by the African countries, we know what it's like to be under an empire. So that is why we oppose Russia. This should have been run with by the Europeans. Instead, they keep going on about European security and 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 you know and how bad Russia is, whereas they should have framed it in much more universal terms. Um, and so I think you know just in terms of thinking of how you can approach it, I think it has got to be the city on the hill in a way, you know, the shining city on the on the hill, and just because you can't intervene directly, you can't. You can't fund NGOs because they've blocked that off. You can barely defend 
uh, civil rights, you know, human rights defenders. I mean, it's very, very difficult. Um, so I think this is just a time to get smarter, to not repeat some of the mistakes of the past and to get smarter. Can I just say one thing? I was just reminded when, mm -hmm. Andrew, when you talked about naivete um, of, of, of Europeans versus China, my, one of my former PhD students from a very long time ago, Sineku Kusari, who now works for the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, wrote a book, wrote, wrote a thesis and then a book, about European approaches to uh, Russia and democracy in Russia. And I mean, she's just like a bad election would have a fraudulent election would happen. The Europeans would close their eyes and say, yeah, but they're still on the path to democracy. The next time it would be even worse fraud. Yeah, but they're still on the path to democracy. This kind of wishing, 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 wishing that, that the world is actually going to be nicer and avoiding the fact that, you know, avoiding looking the kind of the horror in the, in in in, in front of them, which actually it wasn't right. Um, so they, it was also this kind of naivete versus against uh, uh, Russia, even in the first few years of the Putin uh, regime. Anyway, thanks very much. I was I really enjoyed um, uh, Andrew and Alex's presentations as well. Very uh, stimulating. Please, if you want to respond. Alex, do you want to come in or? Or will I come in? Either way. You, you, <laughs> guess go, first. you go first, Alex. So. Oh, okay. This is the problem with human rights panels, right? Everyone's like too nice to one another. And one uh. <laughs> um, well, look, I agree with uh, everything um, Professor Smith just said about uh, the power of example and owning up to the past. I think that's, that's all exactly right. I think embedded in that is um, you know, what I think the question uh, that, that was asked, that Luigi asked was kind of what how can the EU activate all those standards? And I mean, if, the one th if there's one thing we know about human rights research is that um, high level, uh, high levels of human rights protection correlate very highly with democracy. So protect democracy at all costs, right? Um, and this is perhaps more of a relevant discussion for <laughs> friends on the other side of the Atlantic, but there are some concerning signs in Europe as well, right? So protecting democracy at all costs, I think uh, is, um, is, is part, a big part of the answer for human rights, which I think it agrees a lot with that idea of the, the city on the hill. And a, a few other specific things I would say. One is um, pay attention to protecting dissidents from authoritarian states. <clears throat> um, the issue of transnational repression has become much discussed in the last few years. And even I think the director of, uh, of MI5 in the UK was just talking about it yesterday, right? The plots against Iranians um, living in the UK. Uh, and so what this does, I think how this plugs into human rights is those people are often very well placed to provide sources of information and connection to human rights groups and to give us even information and explain what's going on in the politics of uh, the places they're coming from. Uh, and so I think protecting those dissidents with, um, you know, training law enforcement officials to understand that, um, uh, you know, authoritarian states reach beyond their borders to repress dissent and repress dissidents. Um, is important. I mean, part of this, I mean, it was unrelated it, related to the war, but less so kind of human rights domestically. I mean, sending home 400 Russian spies from the European Union is probably going to reduce transnational repression in Europe. Right? So that's a pretty good thing, I would say. Um, the second uh, specific thing, I think, is to mitigate vulnerabilities. So I think we've, you know, the Russian gas issue is obviously very much uh, in the news, but um, there are other vulnerabilities with regard to China, Saudi Arabia, and, and other authoritarian states that I think affects the politics of the, uh, you know, the politics here, right? Um, and uh, the things that we are willing to do with regard to human rights. Uh, so that's the second, is to mitigate vulnerabilities. The third, and this is maybe more relevant to a small country like Ireland, uh, but develop independent expertise. We are uh, saddled with... Um, uh, Confucius Institutes and sock puppet Chinese think tanks that um, I think distort um, uh, debate about China in this country and crowd out uh, the the will of uh, university administrators in particular to hire independent experts on these areas and that has uh, uh, deleterious effects I think on our public conversation about these uh, about these issues right um, the I want to address the question about um, citizens where are, <laughs> where are ordinary citizens and all of this one I think uh, in, in democratic states I mean I do think that there there is I, I don't think the state can go too far from 
domestic preferences. I mean, obviously it can stray some, but it can't go wildly uh, uh, away from, from domestic preferences in terms of, of engagement. So, um, you know, like here, I would say it would probably be unlikely that, you know, the Irish government would go full in on supporting Russia, right? Because I mean, public opinion is so, so against it. So um, I do think there's some room for public opinion with regard to, to human rights insofar as there's increased skepticism of authoritarian states, I think in Europe. Um, and, and I think that's as a result of, of the, the invasion of Ukraine, let, less so uh, uh, than some other issues. But I think it's like reawakened public opinion to some degree about, um, about uh, um, th those kinds of threats. And in terms of citizens from the authoritarian side, I think, again, I don't think there's really much that can be done to change those attitudes for all the reasons that, um, that have been discussed already, but I think selective support for, um, for people uh, who might find themselves in exile or something, uh, I think is, is useful. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, thanks. I'll respond on, a, on a, a, a couple of those. I mean, maybe just in terms of where to focus, we focus quite a lot, a lot of um, attention on fully authoritarian states. So China, now Russia, you know, Iran and, and, and so on. And for obvious reasons, you know, it's very difficult, short, short of effectively revolutionary change to, to achieve ch change in those countries. But th there are a whole bunch of kind of middle countries which are democratizing recent recently democratized possibly you know partly retreating from 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 democracy and it's certainly from an eu perspective it strikes me that that you know that those might be countries where you might hope to have you know more influence in terms of promoting democracy democracy and human rights so that seems to me would be you know one, one obvious point um the Second point I would make is that um, going back to Karen's point about the Cold War, um, you know, the authoritarians have learned. And if you look at this, you know, very explicitly in the Chinese case, after the Soviet Union broke up, they basically went and looked and you know, they, they commissioned massive, you know, studies from the, the, the you know, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and, and you know, I know the, the, the kind of party think tanks and so on as to, you know, what what went wrong. And their conclusions were that you need you you need to kind of maintain your ideological strength. You need to maintain your leadership unity. You need to maintain a tough approach, and if necessary, you need to be able willing to use repression in 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 ver very 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 brut brutal means. So you know, I mean, you know, we, if you like, in the Western domestic democratic world, may. Have learned, or you know, thought we've learned certain lessons from the end of the Cold War and the Helsinki process, and so on. But 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 the authoritarians have have, have learned those as well. And, and if you ask me, I mean, you know, I I think you you probably see that playing out in Iran right now. Um, so unfortunately, that's rather depressing. Then the sanctions point. Um, I mean, you could link this to the to the um the the broader sanctions literature. And I think probably one of the broad con conclusions is that sanctions are often an ineffective and or a very blunt uh, instrument. And to think that, you know, we can use sanctions against China or Russia or Iran or, you know, kind of fully authoritarian states with the expectation that that's going to um, lead to an, an, a meaningful improvement in human rights is, is probably um, unrealistic. But for me, that doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't sanction states. I mean, I, I think there's there's a very important kind of normative and signaling point about sanctions as well. So um, just some thoughts on sanctions there. Thanks, Professor Smith. Yeah, I, I, yeah excellent points. I was just going to um, add, it's like not giving stuff away, <laughs> right? I mean, um, there's, a, there's an awful lot of sort of um, you know, we should be giving a, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's just like, you know, we, we have, we don't necessarily, it doesn't have to be called a sanction, but just don't do the positive thing. Don't, um, you know, don't trade with them. I mean, I think Alex was saying, just like create these, I mean, I, it's decoupling and all the rest of it, but just be much more, um, you know, 
just be much more aware of where the money's flowing. I mean, I, I'm saying this, and I don't think that this is ever going to happen. But I just, you know, there, there, there are just huge sums of money right now, for example, that even Russia is getting simply because, you know, we closed one thing off, but we didn't close all the other stuff off, and so they're making billions and billions off off of this sort of, you know, off of oil and all the rest of it. But I just think that there's often we just we, um, yeah, we. I, I would just, for example for the EU aid budget, I would really tightly focus it. And I think that's an excellent idea, focusing it on those kind of wobbly democratic uh, uh, regimes and then cut off the rest. I mean, you know, be be much more, frankly, be much more hard headed about it, possibly not on climate change stuff, but then you can link it and you can say, well, this is money only for climate mitigation. It's, you know, um, but I, I just think that I just stop giving stuff away. You know, it's, it just is amazing to me how, um, yeah, how naively generous sometimes I think um, the EU has been. Sorry, I'll stop now. Bad EU, isn't it? <laughs> I just wonder. Uh, there, there was a there was a mixing of the trade um, regime and aid and, and and development aid, and I'm not sure whether trade sanctions on the basis of human rights violations are really something which can be done under WTO law without proper UN cooperation. So that's probably something for our next uh, meeting on which isn't wasn't wasn't thought about this. And then with state with with uh, development aid, so that would be a plea for adapting the conditionality regime which the EU adopts internally to external aid. I mean, there um, is supposed to be conditionality now. There's human yeah, rights there clauses is. in the trade, mm. supposedly, tra human rights clauses in the trade agreements and in, and in the aid agreements that the EU has, which occasionally it has used to redirect to redirect aid. Um, but it's amazing how bad you have to be before that happens. I mean, you, you have to do some pretty appalling stuff before the EU takes any kind of action um, at all. Yeah, but but all this conversation is still moving the, between the EU and the states. <laughs> Citizens' yeah, agency yeah, is yeah, just yeah. not on the radar. Okay, I'm yeah. learning policy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I d wanted to, to switch off. I mean, maybe I, I could just add one thing sure. on the, the the citizens bit. I mean, the, the, the some... I suppose one of the... Um, hopes or aspirations of this EU-China human rights dialogue was that it would include an element of that 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 kind of citizen citizen engagement and I suppose to be fair you know to some extent maybe it did although go back to Alex's point that you know when, when you talk about civil society and non-governmental groups in China they're you know ordinarily you know government or go government approved um, groups. I mean, also, again, I suppose on the EU China bit, one of the other things is there's um, as part of this strategic partnership, there has been a huge um, dialogue architecture. So there's, you know, I don't know, city to city dialogues between, you know, EU cities and Chinese cities. There are, uh, you know, environmental policy dialogues between um, you know, EU and EU member state, you know, policy makers and actors with counterparts on the on the on the Chinese side. So, you know, one of certainly the the implicit goals of the EU was to engage also Chinese citizens, you know, with, you know, if not explicitly, then impl implicitly maybe with elements of a, of, a, of, of a rights agenda. But, you know, how substantive and in fact impactful you know that is is obviously con constrained by the, br the broader nature of, of, of the Ch Chinese regime I think. I think if I may uh, attempt a uh, reflection on where citizens should be it is it is important that we remember as Professor Smith said it's not like the European Union or Europe is the sphere of light and everywhere else is uh, uh, is wrong uh, by definition, meaning that citizens of an authoritarian state um, are still people who perhaps support the regime, perhaps don't support the regime. 
engagement with those people might be key to uh, pursuing a pursuing a foreign policy that exports democracy or exports whatever is valuable from the European Union. This is why I think, for example, when politicians suggest to ban Russians from entering the European Union by virtue of their citizenship, I, I think that that is, that is not only uh, intellectually flawed, but it is also politically counterproductive. So that's perhaps a place where citizens come in. Uh, interesting that uh, none of the speakers essentially thought that law had much of a role to play in this. Um, so that's why we will offer a corrective to that in the second panel and see uh, how or whether these principles and these notions might confer rights uh, and what kind of rights they might confer to citizens within the EU. Uh, but Dagmar, do you want to add something else? No. I mean, just have a matter, a matter of having vis uh, stark facial expressions. <laughs> I, I just think when, when, when Professor Smith, when, when Karen Smith did talked, you talked a lot about UN conventions and these are rights, yeah? These convey rights. It, these are meant to make signatory states conveying rights. So that's more the way international law works. So you did talk about law. This is a bit unfair that she didn't talk about law. It's not correct. It's just that the role of the citizens on the ground in this law and how they can actually use it and what the international sphere could do more, that's, that's something, well, which probably is difficult to imagine because international law is so indirect when it comes to um, empowering citizens because it asks the states to empower the citizens and then tries to get citizens empowered through state sanctions. Yeah, so it's not very direct, but well, there, there is a link. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I was thinking, I mean, you could, well, a slight link. I mean, um, I mean, the problem, of course, is that the international treaties aren't, aren't binding in any real sense of the in sense of the word. There are no there are no penalties, right? Other than say the the embarrassment of being called out. I mean, there's no serious penalties for the international treaties, different from some of the regional uh, treaties. But I think, you know, there's the complaints mechanisms that the UN set up, um, which is one way. And I suppose, you know, I think um, uh, Alex was mentioning how to support dissidents. One could think of ways of supporting. Um, you'd have to do it on the sly, though. You can't do it outright because it'll be shut down. Um, supporting citizens who are issuing complaints against their own government via some of the treaty body um, committees at the, at the UN. Um, but yeah, I think it is quite, yeah, it's quite a role for citizens, I think is difficult in under these particular circumstances. And Prof. Bukowski um, and uh, Andrew, do you want to have one final sentence? One final sentence. Um, no, I mean, the thing that's, it, I think, striking is, um, had we been having this conversation in 1993, we would be talking about advancing human rights and spreading human rights. And now with, with uh, you know, those pesky authoritarian holdouts in a defensive crouch, and now it feels the reverse. It feels like democracy is under threat, actually. And we're talking about, we've lowered our standards not only to not promote human rights abroad, but rather to protect our own systems from authoritarian encroachment or what some call authoritarian practices. You know, we, it feels like we're on the defensive now in, in many ways. Um, and so um, I think that's a striking change. And I think, again, that's borne out by the change in relative underlying power of democratic and non-democratic states. So I think that problem is not going away. Andrew? Thanks. And maybe, I mean, my, my final point might be to kind of um, come back to, you know, what I call this, the, this middle group of countries um, and maybe to link that to, you know, a point about recognising our, our own flaws. I mean, I actually don't know whether, for instance, the EU and Brazil or the EU and India have human rights dialogue, but actually, you know, kind of EU India, EU Brazil, EU South Africa, you know, whoever it might be, 
genuine dialogues which weren't of the tone of you know okay we we've got human rights fixed and we're here to tell you guys how to put them right but you know they could you, you could see that that might potentially be uh, something more more kind of creative or or, or construct constructive and and also to, to Dagmar's point it would maybe open up scope for involvement of individual citizens civil society non-governmental groups in 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 in, in a meaningful way as well. Uh, yeah, and climate and environment. I think just like the environment proved to be the kind of the training ground for lots of activists and dissidents behind the Iron Curtain, um, I think you could, there's scope there. Uh, you know, just thinking about Brazil, for example, I'm a Brazil and India and South Africa are lined up against the EU at, in the Human Rights Council, almost reliably. Right. I mean, they cannot get them on board whatsoever. But some of the other countries, say Ghana, a kind of um, or Gambia, those kind of the states in, in the US, some of the African states, other African states, I think you could possibly work on. But I was thinking on the climate stuff, you know, that isn't that is that's an area where you could, you know, you can there are links between climate and and human rights and you could start to build connections and and, and whatnot, just like it happened in the behind the Iron Curtain, you know, complaining about your rivers running red and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah. Great. So are there any questions from anyone else in the call? No. If not, uh, uh, all is left to do is to thank the speaker for uh, most interesting